Our penultimate topic for chemistry 2 is topic G, fertilisers. Now there's lots of links to stuff we've already done, which is pretty good really. So, fertilisers are chemicals that give plants essential chemical elements needed for growth. Basically, they make your plants grow faster, bigger, and mean you get more of them. Now, this is important because, as we've mentioned, the population of the Earth is growing exponentially, so we need more food for more people. So, fertilisers help us do that. Now, hopefully, you're remembering uh, one of the recent videos you watched where I mentioned something that is very important for making fertilisers and hopefully you're all suddenly shouting at the screen oop that's ammonia um, so we'll get onto the ammonia in a second but the three main essential elements that we want to be in our fertilisers are nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium so N, P and K are their chemical symbols and urea is something that can also be used as a fertilizer and urea sounds like urine because urea is the main component of urine it's dissolved it's what's dissolved in water to make urine so um, it's quite possible to use uh, bio toilets as a means of fertilization it's just people are a bit um, twitchy about eating food that's been fertilized with human waste although there's absolutely nothing wrong with it anyway moving on um, for fertilisers to be useful, they need to be soluble in water. And the reason for that is that the way the plants take up the fertiliser is through their roots. And they take up water in their roots. So we need the fertiliser to be dissolved to be dissolved in the water they're going to take up from the soil. Right, so we've said some good stuff about fertilisers, but there is some bad stuff as well. And this is one of those big long words you're just going to have to learn, I'm afraid. It's eutrophication. So this here, this picture, this shows you a lake where eutrophication is happening. So the bits that you really need to know for the foundation are in black and the higher in white, but you do need to know it's a bad thing. So what happens is the fertilizer gets washed off the field. So when it rains, that um, water is going to take some of the fertilizer with it because as we said the fertilizer dissolves in water and it eventually it'll run into lakes and rivers and streams. Once the fertilizer gets into the lakes and the rivers it's going to do its job, it's going to make plants grow. Now the plant that's going to get it in the lakes and rivers is algae and the algae is going to grow like mad and that's what you can see in the picture because all this green stuff here, all of this, this is just the algae that's grown. Now, in a healthy pond, you should be able to see through. And if you can see through, it means that sunlight can get through. But when the algae grows like mad, like this, it blocks out the sunlight and it just absorbs the sunlight and doesn't let any get to the plants that live at the bottom. And it's the plants that live at the bottom of lakes and rivers that make the oxygen. Now, if they don't get any sunlight, they die. If they die, there's no longer any oxygen in the lakes and in the water. If there's no oxygen, pretty much everything else that lives in the water is going to die because there's no oxygen. So eutrophication can kill off an awful lot of species inside um, water-based ecosystems. And it's because the fertiliser has um, made an overabundance of one of the components of a food chain and the algae just goes so mad that it outcompetes everything else and it kills it all off. So eutrophication a bad thing. So whilst fertilizers are useful they need to be used responsibly otherwise they become pollutants and they just pollute our water systems. Right then the last little bit for this one then is all about how we make fertilizers. Now most fertilizers are salts and hopefully you remember that we can make salts by neutralization reactions. Now, you need to be able to predict or suggest which acid should be reacted with which base to make the following salts. Now, this shouldn't actually be too scary because we just talked about this in acids and bases. We just have to go the other way. So if you remember, the first part of the name 
tells you about the base. So if it's ammonium, it means we used ammonia. And then the second part of the name tells you about the acid. So here it's sulfate, so we used sulfuric acid. And it's the same with the others. So ammonium nitrate, so that must be ammonia and nitric acid. Ammonium phosphate, ammonia and phosphoric acid. And then the last one is potassium nitrate. So um, it's just going to be potassium hydroxide. If you put potassium oxide, that would be absolutely fine. They would probably even let you get away with potassium carbonate. So you just need to remember it's potassium and then one of those ending names, really. And nitrate, so it must be nitric acid again. So this is just building on what we did with the acids and bases. So hopefully not too terrifying. Right then, the last bit is only for the higher paper. And it's about how we make our um, salt, but how we make it exactly right. So it's a neutralization reaction. So that means we're going to mix our alkali and our acid. And what we use, um, well, when we do it, we want to make sure we only use exactly the right amount of the chemicals. So we haven't got any, you know, too much acid or too much alkali. We want to get it exactly right. So we get as much product as possible. So we do an experiment to find out how much we should use. And that experiment is called a titration. And the equipment you use is this stuff down here. Now the big bit of equipment that will be new to you is this thing here. And it's called a burette. Now basically it's kind of like a measuring cylinder. So it's got uh, volumes down the side here. And then there's just a tap at the bottom. So it just tells you how much you've let out the tap. So the first time you do this, to figure out how much base, how much alkali you want to put in, is you put a known amount of acid in the bottom, so 100 millilitres. Then you put an indicator in. Then you slowly add your base until it goes neutral. Then that tells you how much you needed. But this is science. We don't trust ourselves to do it once. We repeat it. And we repeat until we get something called concordance which is just a posh way of saying that we get two results that are within 0 0.1 millilitres of each other. So we get two results that are very, very close. Then that means we know exactly how much to add. So I might know that I need to add 55.1 centimetres cubed of my alkali to 100 centimetres cubed of my acid. Now that I know that, I do the reaction again, but without the indicator, because the indicator would uh, pollute my product. It would be an impurity. I don't want it there. So I do it without the, pro the indicator. Now, if you remember, when we do our neutralization reaction, we get our base and our acid going to make a salt plus water. Now, I don't want the water. So all I do is leave my solution to evaporate, and I'm left over with crystals of my salt at the end. Now, this isn't really as bad as it sounds. It's just a couple of pieces of equipment to remember and the idea of that we do it with the indicator to find out how much and then without so we get our pure product. But the reaction itself is one that we just did in acids and bases, so it's nothing new there. Okay, so that is it for this topic. Now, remember, if you've got any questions, do not hesitate to ask when you see me.